Salutations everybody, it is Maddie here today and we got that gigantic Fallout 76 info dump. I mean, Game Informer got up here, dropped their pants and was like, here's the biggest info dump for Fallout 76 yet. And we're sifting through that dump, finding main story details, event information, base building stuff, some of the leveling system has expanded, player counts, and so much more. Get comfortable, we got a lot, a lot, a lot to go over. It's easily gonna be the longest Fallout news update of my entire channel's history. So let's get into it, starting off with the player count. Before the article even starts, we see right here, style, 24 player online action role playing game. Prior to this, we were not aware of how many players would be on a server at a time because Bethesda didn't want to confirm anything. They were still play testing. Now we know officially it's 24 players. And let me get into why I find this a bit of a sweet spot. For me, the reason 24 is a sweet spot is because I feel it fits all play styles. If you're trying to play by yourself, the encounters are relatively low. If you're looking for folks, those encounters are going to be more of a rarity and thus more special. And this is not including the people you team up with on said server. I think it also heightens moments that we don't really consider, like when you hear a gunshot, it's a, oh shit, that is a real player nearby, and knowing it's a 24 player server, once again, really punctuates that moment. I also wanted to highlight quite a bold claim that I think people will be pretty excited about that this article starts off with, as someone who has been a Fallout fan for a very long time and enjoys the solo single player experience. I recently sat down with the development team to find out what makes Fallout 76 tick, and can now confidently communicate exactly what it is. If you simply want another solo Fallout experience, Experience, Bethesda is making this game for you. If you desire a Fallout game that you can enjoy with your closest friends, Bethesda also has you covered. If you want an RPG with PvP and instances, put Fallout 76 on your radar. The game embraces all of these styles of play, and you have a direct hand in determining how much of any given one you experience. So what Andrew is trying to focus on here is that there is a flexibility within the game systems to allow you to say, you know what, I want to play by myself today versus, you know what, I want to enjoy playing with a team today, and that there's multiple ways the game offers to enjoy different play styles. We're going to see how much the article supports that, so let's get right into it. Although Bethesda has talked at length about Fallout 76 being a survival experience that pushes as players to keep their hunger and thirst in check, it is still a game driven by quests. When you emerge from the vault, you receive a transmission from the overseer. Quote, she left before everybody, Howard says. She left secret instructions for you. That's kind of the jumping on point for what we call the main quest. At the end of it, you launch the nukes. The nukes are a game system, but they are also a part of the main story. Hmm, so there's a lot to take in already. Number one is, what are the new details here? We knew the Overseer played a part in the quest, but we did not know that she left before everybody. On top of that, the secret instructions, that's also news to us. However, I want to highlight what Todd says, his particular wording of what we call the main quest, as if it's really hard to distinguish a difference between that and actual content. I don't want to split hairs or look too deep here, but I have to say that his wording wasn't ultimately convincing for what this is supposed to be. Don't you know what the main story is versus what the side content is? Furthermore, we see that they say that the nukes are unlocked during this story, but the article says at the end, which means did they just spoil the end game reward? If so, I imagine this story is nothing more than a way to get players on a ride to unlock a game system and nothing more. It doesn't seem like an emphasis on storytelling. I mean, we look at Fallout 4 where whether you liked or hated the story, we know Bethesda said that was a big thing they wanted to push forward. They said, you know what, we're focusing on the story. That's why we're doing voice protagonists. We want to hit home those emotional moments, stuff along those lines to really emphasize their story. But here saying this is what we call kind of the main story, that doesn't sound convincing for what a lot of us value as Fallout fans. This Overseer's quest is not something you can blaze through. It's a lengthy, multi-part story that takes players across West Virginia. This quest requires the players to be a high level at its conclusion. Even if players stick to this quest, they will still receive optional tasks along the way and will end up having a menu filled with missions that can be selected at any time. Quote, given the nature of the game, you can jump ahead in parts and go back to others, end quote, Howard adds. So the good thing about not being able to blaze through this main story is that for those who just want to build new characters to ruin people's games by nuking areas, by attacking through PvP, you have to work 
to get there. How long the story is, obviously we don't know yet. I don't know what a safe assumption would even be because I'm not accounting for things like level gates. Is that why it's lengthy? Because with very little character interaction, I do imagine that it's hard to create a very large, long story there. If it's only driven by audio tapes and text files, at least in my opinion, if it gets super long, then the story starts to overstay its welcome, which can be honestly worse than just a bad game. Fallout 76 Project Lee Jeff Gardner says the development team didn't want players to simply run past great content. You'll wander near something and will be alerted of a quest like, quote, explore this mind, end quote, he says. In the past, we thought this was a little gamey, but we want you to find it. We're being very proactive with where this content is. You'll have a lot to do very quickly. One of the best feelings of a Bethesda Game Studios game is when you exit the starting area and you're hit with a swath of content that you just don't know where to even start. One of my favorite parts about exploring is having the mini map either on the top or on one of the corners and seeing little logos pop up that are hollow. And as they fill in and it tells me I've discovered an area, it's such a great feeling because it feels like it's a part of the game universe. You're following a map, you're finding an area, you're finding the story inside there. But when they say explore the mind, it's not really a complaint more so, just that I feel it strips away some of the subtlety of finding it for yourself. By this I mean, and this has happened to me a lot of times in games, now let's say I'm walking around and all of a sudden it says explore the cave and I'm like, what cave are they even talking about? It breaks up some of the flow in the gameplay. A lot of what makes a game great is obviously those major decisions, but some subtle ones that play underneath that disrupt the game getting into a rhythm. Things like this that can realistically happen. I know it doesn't sound like a big deal on paper, but ultimately when you're playing the game and you're confused, you're like, what's going on here? It can matter to a degree. However, I'm very jazzed to hear that there's a lot of content to do quickly. Because I remember when I was reviewing Fallout 4, and I was hit right off the bat with what I thought was a ton of areas, but then you go back to previous BGS games and you're hit with way more early on, where I feel like if they're confidently saying, yeah, we are gonna give you a lot quickly, that means like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with myself. Now some more for leveling up. As you continue leveling up, more cards become available and you'll even receive perk card packs as we know from QuakeCon. Each pack mimics Topps baseball cards of old containing four random cards, a joke, and a stick of gum that when chewed reduces your hunger for a while. When you reach a higher level, the frequency of packs drops from every two levels gain to five. You can continue feeding points into special until rank 50. After that, each new level rewards Towards you with just cards. Now I love how they're divvying up the amount of perk card packs they give you every two levels. Think about in the first 10 levels when you're exploring a ton of new areas, you're getting hit with quests, and every two times you level up, you get a slew of perks too to sift through. I mean, this game will definitely, I feel, be front loaded. The question though is can it continue that momentum not only later on in the game, but later in its life cycle? Because what I'm hearing right now is I know those first first 10-ish hours of the game are gonna be awesome. I mean, leveling up a ton, lots of options when you level up, lots of areas to explore, quests, a fresh brand new experience, a new Fallout game, it's gonna be great early on. Furthermore, there are hundreds of cards, Howard says. They all rank up and there are gold versions of each. Fallout 4 and Skyrim's skill systems were great, but when we got into the DLC, we said, let's add skills or perks. We looked at them and said, where? The rules are so strict. The cards allow us to be very flexible moving forward. We can release new perks with events we are doing and also have themed perks. Oh yes man, yes. I love the idea of tying in player progression with timed events that are exclusive to players who stick with the game. I mean, I'm thinking like, it's Christmas day, I'm on Fallout 76, they're like, go do a Santa themed quest, you get a Santa themed perk that has the vault boy in a Santa suit, and you get like an additional amount of carry weight because Santa's good at carrying sacks of toys. Or maybe you get a charisma perk card because of the gift of giving and something along those lines like, yes man, I love this idea. Keep it up. I mean, as you guys can tell, the most exciting part for me about Fallout 76 
is this leveling system. It not only served as a turnaround for me at QuakeCon for how I feel about the game, but also has me excited about multiple builds, playing the game, leveling up, seeing the options, and now knowing it ties into long-term content, it is a superb design decision. Now, I think this one needs to be emphasized. No matter what, cards are not obtained in any way through microtransactions. Again, you can only earn them through leveling. We don't know if they can be traded yet, but you can share one card with your team. That card gives bonuses to everyone. Solo play has been something that the Fallout community has been fixated on. Can you play this game by yourself and will it be a enjoyable, modern Fallout experience without a team at your back? Well, Pete Hines, had some thoughts on that. Pete Hines, Bethesda Senior Vice President of Global Marketing and Communications says he loves Fallout 76's multiplayer aspects, but has recently played it solo and is finding it to be a fascinating experience. Quote, I know it was a concern in our community and it was a concern for me because I play solo a lot in games. Given my schedule, it's hard to find time to group up with folks. With my current character, my plan was I'm walking out of the vault and I'm going left. I haven't been over there and I don't know what's there. Let's see what happens. I came across some super mutants, got into a big fight with them, completed some quests, and found this one location outside of a pharmaceutical plant that seemed like an awesome place for a camp. It had a good view from up top of a mountain. I figured not a lot of people could see me up there, and I've been using that base camp to go off and do quests. Here's the thing. I like what he said, and I'm excited to do exactly what Pete Hines is doing. Just go off in a random direction and quest. But I want to hear this from someone who's not tied into the company and not trying to sell us the game. Not that Pete Hines is a dishonest guy. Bethesda is a very transparent company in many ways. It's why I like covering them. But I would love to hear this from someone who is not of Bethesda that, hey, you can play by yourself and hey, it's actually pretty good. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, he's not gonna say, yeah, it's not that good by yourself. You really should play with friends. They wanna sell the product no matter what. And I get that as a business, it makes sense. But you know, this is the thing is like, even in this article, a very exclusive piece of coverage for a Game Informer, it's clear they didn't get to play the game. They sat and watched. So I would love to hear some type of solo play experience from someone out of Bethesda. Moron events, they are something new to Fallout. When you get near one, it starts broadcasting for help, Howard says. It's like a timed multiplayer quest. As you explore the world, you'll be alerted of them occurring nearby, or you may see some appear on your map. Most are geared for teams, but some may require more player coverage on an area. Bethesda doesn't want to reveal exactly what we can expect from the events, but we do know some appear at random times and places, whereas others appear in specific places and at a specific time. Once you discover one, you can fast travel to it. So I'm pretty sure it was already confirmed, but based on the fact that you can fast travel to events, likely means these are repeatable. As for the ones you dynamically encounter, I think of, for example, when I first discovered the Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout 4, you get a little quest notification that you should listen to a radio broadcast, and I imagine that this will go something along those lines. You're running around, all of a sudden it says, hey, you discovered a new radio broadcast, you should listen to it, something's going on, you hear it, someone calls for your help, you go and save them with a bunch of other players, you all get XP and loot. Sounds good to me. Oh, and hey, look, an example just like that. Gardner detailed one of the smaller events players could possibly come across. You'll get a call about robots in distress, and you basically have to go and escort them to various locations, he says. If they live in the end, you get a reward. That's a random event that will spawn. Some people will join you or not. The robots have a lot of character, and they are sort of the levity of the mission. You'll follow along, and they'll make little comments to you. Gardner noted, events often give the best rewards. If you're looking for better loot and don't have a firm grasp of crafting yet, you'll want to engage in events. That also means becoming part of a multiplayer experience, as most can't be completed solo. Here we are seeing the claim be, yes, you can play by yourself, but one of the key ways to earn experience, loot, is through a multiplayer component. But it is primarily a multiplayer game, so I'm obviously not surprised whatsoever. Doesn't change my opinion on the game. It's just interesting to know, right? Like everything requires you to be with a team. So if you are interested in Fallout 76 and think there is some way to fully enjoy the entirety of this game by yourself, that's just not the case, man. You're gonna need a squad. Cause not every event is going to drag in 20 players across the map to check it out, right? Now for a little bit on multiplayer details. Up to four people can team up together. All the content factors into the group dynamic, even quests. The team leader can queue up a mission which every party member sees and can engage in if they choose to do so. Should you get separated from your friends or need to travel great distances to your settlement 
or a hub to resupply your gear, you can immediately fast travel back to any one of your teammates. I like that setup, it's a little more organized. You got the party leader, he sets the quest for everybody, everyone gets the same notifications at the same time, it all progresses in one cohesive way. It reminds me kind of like when ESO first dropped and the group feature wasn't that great, so I would have one quest active as a group leader, but my quest partners would have another quest active, and it just led to bugs and me and him trying to finish quests at the same time, but it just not working all that well and it felt like a separate experience in what was supposed to be a multiplayer part of the gameplay. This Fallout experience is a bit harsher in the terms of how the world is structured. It's more of a zoned game and more level jumped than our previous stuff, Howard says. Some of the feedback we've gotten is, I'm just gonna run across the map, I died, it got hard. There's a reason for that. We have higher level zones. That's not to say the game won't factor in your level. If you enter a zone, things may spawn between level 40 and 60, depending on your level. If you enter that area at a lower level, well, you're in for a hell of a fight. If you're in a group, the first place player in sets the level range. If that player leaves the area, the next player in changes the level. Bethesda says the game is divided into six regions, but wouldn't give specifics for each. Howard did say the cranberry bogs are really really hard. Now there may be those out there who are freaking out or unaware of this, but Bethesda Game Studios have historically had rubber banding in the past, so this isn't anything too different. If you don't know what rubber banding is, it's pretty much when you go into an area you're not supposed to, you're going to die a lot because that's a higher leveled zone compared to where you start the game. So having the game split up into zones makes sense. I just wonder, do zones level up with you? So let's say I go to Cranberry Bogs, that is the 40 to 60 area, but the starting areas 0 to 10 will being in the starting area benefit me 30 40 hours into the game or do you just spend all of the end game inside the cranberry bogs what is the benefit to going back to a lower level zone does that zone bump up a little bit at some point in time when you enter maybe like a veteran mode or something along those lines to just increase the difficulty overall these are just questions that circle in my head immediately upon reading it because it just sounds like at this point in time, which I doubt is the case, but the rest of the world becomes useless as you level up throughout zones and they become a breeze ultimately. Now, while teams are limited to just four players, you can technically play with other people on your system's list. You just can't group up with them in game. Don't expect to see people everywhere. It's definitely not an MMO with hundreds of players running around a service as development director Chris Meyer. We have 24 players on one server on a map that's four times the size of Fallout 4. There will be times you see other players, but we hope it's not something that's commonplace. If you're thinking of creating private servers for 24 of your closest friends, Meyer says Fallout 76 isn't launching with private servers. Is there a chance you can join a faction that may support a larger number of people? We'll answer that later. Todd Howard says with a smile. <laughs> yes. I want factions so bad in Fallout 76. They gotta make it happen, man, because that would bring communities together. Large groups of people would play Fallout 76 and contribute to a greater cause. I'd love to have faction wars in Fallout 76. Like, obviously they're gonna add at some point a team deathmatch or something. And imagine if my faction faced off against Lone's faction or something along those lines. My faction would win, by the way. But that would be fucking awesome, right? When you are doing group of events, we turn off the PvP, Gardner says. If all these random people are fighting a giant monster, you don't want to get hit by a stray bullet and then be in PvP. We wanted to make it an intentional thing. If you accidentally hit someone with a stray bullet outside of these zones and don't want to trigger PvP, you can wave a pacifist flag to shut it down. Griefers also can't camp out in front of Vault 76 to pick off new players. The PvP gameplay is not available until you reach level 5. I gotta say, man, next to the leveling up system, I'm really appreciating how they're handling griefing in Fallout 76. I mean, it seems like they have a good grip on how to constrain assholes online and not reward them whatsoever. I think that's a smart decision to say like, you can do it, just it's not gonna be beneficial. I just hope it doesn't put all the players in line and that obviously I feel there are gonna be players who rebel against the system, try to kill someone, and then they get chased down by the entire map for it. Now here's one of my favorite parts of the article. The camp building should be familiar to anyone who played Fallout 4, offering similar functionality for how electricity works and components click together. If you play the game cooperatively, your team can help you build your base. You can connect settlements with everyone in your party to make it a larger space, although each player needs to be online to have their part of the settlement appear in the world. We had one test 
where a dozen people built their camps next to each other and created an enormous city, Meyer says. See, I'm pumped to stream this game, man, because I'm thinking like when the private servers drop, I get a bunch of Twitch viewers in and we recreate I don't know, Megaton from Fallout 3 or New Reino from Fallout 2 because we can have 24 people all connecting their settlements together with their own respective materials. That sounds so dope. And if you mod into those servers, special pieces for the settlement, unlimited resources, just think of the awesome creations that can come from this when we see these cool settlements in Fallout 4 by one person. Imagine what happens when you have a team of 24 or 12 or four in general. This is gonna be a really cool feature. Not that I'm the biggest fan of settlement mode, but if we're gonna go into the co-op features, this will definitely aid the game experience. Each player builds one home base, but there are also public workshop spaces that you can come across. Howard says they almost feel like event zones. It's a space that you can take over that has a lot of supplies. You and the people on your team can build there. There's gameplay with resource generation. There are enemy waves that attack these spots. This camp is temporary. However, when you leave, another team can roll in to claim it as their own. Off the cuff example maybe could be, oh, we need oil to create something for our settlements or to craft a part for our weapons. So let's go to this event zone, we'll call it, and take over an oil rig. Then there's gonna be waves of enemies that come in while you're generating the resources, collecting them all. You clear out, let's say, six waves. You say, all right, we got all the oil we need. Let's clear out of here. And you just leave that space for another player to come in and use if they need oil. Your camp will also be the haven for other players, not in your team. Although Bethesda is still trying to figure out exactly how this will play out. You can walk up to someone else's camp and harvest their plants. You can go through their stashes, but you can get some things that regenerate. Right now, it's a crime to take fruits and vegetables, and you'll find yourself in trouble. That may change by the time the game launches. One thing you won't have to worry about is power armor. In Fallout 4, if it ran out of juice, you had to climb out of it, leave it, and return with a new fusion core. The power armor is now treated like an inventory item rather than a vehicle. You still get in and out of it, but you can now pick it up. Oh man, I really liked how Fallout 4's power armor felt like a vehicle, you know? It felt like it was something there, a part of the world that you could go to and from for certain parts of areas to explore. I don't like this decision that much, although I get it. You can't have players scattering like 50,000 power armor frames all over the place. It's just easier to let them pick it up and put it in their inventory. I'm not totally unaccustomed to that because previous Fallout games always had to go through the inventory system. It's just a change in Fallout 4 that I really liked for immersion. And so it's gonna be kind of weird to see this big power armor frame that's bulky as shit that's like a tank and you're like yeah I'll just throw it in my backpack sure why not personal quirks aside I'm actually curious what this crime system is though they say that taking for example regenerative objects from other people's camps will result in a crime and you'll be punished and I'm like what is gonna happen exactly maybe if the player sets up security in their base like turrets or robots that can patrol the area the second a player comes in and says I'm gonna take five apples from them that everyone can open fire on him that would be interesting to see and i also wonder if a player who owns said base would get penalized for retaliating saying like hey you can't steal my stuff and shooting him as he's taking it closing off with a very interesting comment usually when we finish a game we're pretty sick of it howard admits we don't want to see it again with this one because of the other players we're really excited to play it when it's out that's when it's really alive I get that, man, because I've been saying for a while that Fallout 76 really isn't going to catch steam until a couple months after launch, I feel. And so for them, they're probably thinking like, all right, we're setting up the framework and like a year from now, this game can be freaking dope. That's, that's how games as a service work. And I'm not saying it's okay. I get people got beef with it and I'm right there with you in many departments. But, but I think based off even this interview, that's what Bethesda is preparing for is a lot of the long-term stuff. Anyway, that is your super bulky, opinion-loaded info dump on Fallout 76. I hope you guys enjoyed. I'd really appreciate you sharing this video because this is going to be a bitch to edit. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed one more time. Let me know what you think about all this brand new information in the comments down below. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. Those links are in the description down below along with my Patreon. Do consider supporting that as it fuels all the content I create here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.